Yeah, hello and welcome back to our PML school. Uh, my name is Bernd Wendt and I'm here with Dan Weiner, who will be uh, giving a presentation today about analysis and comparison of link turnover and receptor binding models. Uh, before we start, uh, let me remind you that we will record this session and uh, we will make uh, the link to the recorded session available uh, on the Satara forum, forum after the event. We will also post uh, the uh, slide deck and the textual model um, to the Satara forum. So please uh, check this uh, out uh, you know, if you want uh, more details on, on, on today's session. And uh, during the session, uh, you can post comments and questions into the Q&A panel that you can see right to the uh, WebEx console. Um, we will come to that after the presentation during a Q&A session where we want to uh, cover as many questions as will fit into the time. But for now, I uh, uh, want to hand over to Dan Weiner to give the presentation. So please, Dan, it's yours. All right, thanks, Bern. So as Bern said, we're going to cover a comparison of uh, link turnover and receptor binding models on a particular data set. Uh, this is actually following uh, example PD21 in the textbook I co-authored with Johan Gabrielsen. But one of the interesting thing, aspects of this particular example is that we weren't able to find a PK model that, that gave an adequate fit. Um, so instead of using a actual PK model to drive PD, we're going to use what we call a table function. That is, we're going to use the, P, the PK data itself to drive the model. And um, uh, as I go through the exercises, we'll show how to do that. In terms of background, um, this data came from a, a company that had been using uh, a single point assay for a preclinical screen. Um, and I, I think if you do a lot of modeling, you understand the uh, negative aspects of doing a, a single point assay, but many times due to cost and other factors, and, uh, and having an ability to screen a large number of compounds, uh, many companies still uh, use a process like this. Uh, but the scientists had chosen uh, collecting a response at 60 minutes only, uh, thinking or hoping that that was somewhere around the time the maximal response. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, when he got engaged with the PK scientist, uh, they suggested an alternative approach which required a uh, collection of, of more time series type of data. And that's what we're going to go through uh, today and talk about. So this particular study was run in rabbits. And here we're looking at data actually in a single rabbit um, that received two oral doses of a drug, uh, one and two micromole per kilogram. Uh, and this was on two different occasions. So if you look at the data across all rabbits, uh, there's very high intra and intersubject variability, both in rate and extent of absorption. And as I mentioned, the PK data did not display a, a classical uh, PK model profile. And I'll show you uh, the rabbit's data in just a minute. Uh, but in this particular instance, uh, because we're really focusing on how to use PML to define the mechanistic models, we're just going to focus on data from one rabbit. So the goal was to come up with an approach uh, that would be simple and easy to implement. And the approach that we're going to use, as I mentioned, is this utilization of a table function where we use the actual observed data. And again, we will apply three different models uh, to the data set, and that is a link model, uh, also called an effect compartment model, a turnover model, and a receptor binding model. So here's what the data look like. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a plot of the plasma concentration uh, versus time. And let me just turn on my, see if I can turn on the laser pointer here. Yeah. Um, you can see that it looks like a mono-exponential decline, decline, so you think it might be appropriate to fit a one-compartment model to it. Although, um, and we will do that, but you'll see it's not a good fit. But it, if, if you look at this aspect um, of the lower dose in particular, you see that no classical model uh, is going to be able to fit that well. On the right-hand side, we see a corresponding plot of time versus uh, the response. And 
the, as you can see, uh, there's a baseline value of about 100, and uh, that was expected for this particular assay. Um, and then as the drug concentrations increase, the response decreases, and you can see at the higher dose, um, we're almost completely blocking the response. It goes almost down to zero. Uh, and then as plasma concentrations wane, of course, the response uh, recovers. And then, as we mentioned, we have three candidate models uh, that will fit to this particular data set. So if you fit a one compartment model to the data, um, you see that there are some deficiencies. Um, in particular, if you look at the lower dose, a one compartment model uh, just isn't able to fit that absorption uh, profile that we talked about earlier. And even at the higher dose, we're missing Cmax. Um, and if you look at the CVs uh, for the, for the uh, fixed effects for Ka and volume, uh, you see that they're, they're quite large. So the good news is in situations like this where you're fitting these classical PKPD models, the basic assumption is that PK is driving PD, but PD does not impact PK. In other words, if you look at our classical PKPD models, if you looked at the PK aspects of the model, it doesn't include any specific PD parameters. Um, and that's why the PD will not affect it. So if you're in a situation where you've actually collected PK samples at the same time as you've collected the PD samples, you can just use the observed PK data to model the data. Um, so another way to think about this is, in classical PKPD models, the PK model only serves uh, uh, to function as a smoothing function. It just smooths out the data so that you could use that smooth curve in order to estimate concentrations at each of the times where you took PD measurements. But as I said, in this case, we have a very rich data set, and PK and PD are measured at the same times. Uh, so we can actually bypass the PK model step. So here we're looking at the corresponding hysteresis curve. So here we're plotting plasma concentration versus response. And you can see if you look at the low dose, there's very little evidence of hysteresis. And sometimes that happens in situations where you haven't given a dose high enough to really have a, a marked change in the response. On the other hand, where we gave the higher dose, where the response drops uh, far lower uh, than it does for the low dose, then we're able to see a pronounced hysteresis and it's going in a clockwise fashion. The good news is, um, again, when we use this table function kind of approach, uh, it's also applicable to situations where you have these temporal effects where hysteresis is actually present. So it's, it, it's a pretty powerful uh, paradigm for modeling uh, situations like this. So here are our three candidate models. Um, on the left, we have here a basic um, PK model tied to an effect compartment. Uh, this is also called a link model. Then we're also going to look at a turnover model where we're going to assume that the drug is inhibiting the production of response, and that's why the curve then declines. And then we'll look at a standard receptor binding model. So we have three candidate uh, models. We'll talk about how to get initial estimates for these, and then we'll also talk about how to tie them to the PK table function. So here's the corresponding uh, model equations. And I apologize, it looks like our WebEx server uh, is missing some fonts. But everywhere you see a little box, that's just a multiplication sign. So um, everything else looks to be OK. So again, um, here's our standard uh, effect compartment model. It's just that when we look at CP, uh, in the two equations here, we're not going to use CP that's predicted from a PK model. We're going to use the actual observed CP values. And then here's the corresponding turnover model where we're inhibiting the production of effect. And again, for CP in this model, uh, we're going to use the observed plasma concentration data. And then here's the corresponding uh, receptor binding model where Bmax in this model denotes the total receptor pool minus the concentration of bound receptors. In other words, it's the receptors available uh, to actually work in the system. So here's the three basic models. And then again, uh, for this exercise, we're going to go through the implementation uh, of these uh, in Phoenix. 
So first, for the link model, we need to get uh, derive initial estimates of the model. So you may have dialed in when we did um, one of the uh, prior examples uh, where we also fit a, 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 an effect compartment model and we showed how to use the semi-parametric uh, routine in the wind nonlin uh, toolbox in order to collapse the hysteresis curve. We just use that again now here. And if we guess at a value of KEO, and I went through a number of KEO values, trial and error, but a value of KEO of about 0.04 really does a very nice job of collapsing the hysteresis curve. Um, so that is what we'll use for an initial estimate of KEO. And then if we look at the concentration corresponding to about a 50% decrease uh, in the response, uh, then we see that we can have an estimate of IC50 that's about 40. So that would be our uh, two initial estimates for that model. Of course, R0 is assumed to be about 100. And here, because uh, we've got little to no curvature in the model, we're going to force IMAX to be equal to 1. So in order to set up this model, uh, you would first send it to uh, a library, PK Emax model, tell it you want an effect compartment. Um, we're going to, you could tell it we're going to freeze PK, although we're going to eliminate them anyway. Um, and then we want an inhibitory response uh, because as drug increases, the response decreases. Then we're going to convert that to textual and we're going to edit the model as indicated on this slide. So things that are in red uh, or edits that I applied to the model. So one of the first things we want to do is get rid of all the equations that correspond to the PK model, because we're not going to use a PK model. Instead, we're going to add this covariate C statement, so we're going to input the observed data uh, in order to get plasma concentrations, as opposed to using this, uh, this fitted model. So then uh, I commented out the structural parameters and the fixed effects. I added initial estimates for KEO uh, and IC50. And then uh, E0, and I should have highlighted uh, E0 here, the freeze part in red as well, because I typed that in. Uh, in this particular instance, we don't need to estimate the baseline because this is like a rating scale function, and we know that the uh, baseline is 100. So things that are in red are just the few edits uh, that you need to do to the data. All right? And then these, of course, we're actually deleting. If you fit this model to the data, uh, here are the estimated parameters, and we had guessed KEO was about 0.04, and the actual, which was pretty good. The point estimate was about 0.026. Uh, the CV is very good. The IC50, we had guessed about 40. Uh, our estimate, we, again, was very good. It's about 44.8. Uh, and the precision is very, very good. So if you look at the thetas, um, very good precision, which is good. But if you look at a plot of the observed versus uh, predicted data, um, the Predicted curve is not fitting uh, the observed data as well as we would like, uh, particularly for the higher dose. Um, so it kind of mimics the trends in the data, uh, but it's uh, a bit deficient in what we'd like to see. All right, let's go on to the next model. Now we'll talk about the turnover model. And again, these little boxes are multiplication signs. Uh, so this is the basic uh, turnover model. We're inhibiting the production of effect. Um, We've already got an estimate of IC50 because we used that in a prior model. Uh, in order to estimate K out, um, you can look at a log linear plot of the response versus time just for the first couple of time points. Um, because if, if you think about this model, if you had a huge bolus dose, you're going to totally inhibit the production of effect. So then the response is just falling off. Uh, on a semi-log scale with a slope of minus k out. So that's why you can just look at uh, the initial decline for a couple of points and estimate uh, k out. Um, and then kn can be estimated uh, as the baseline times k out because the baseline is equal to kn over k out. And that's approximately equal to 1. So in this case, then, um, we're going to send the data to pk tied to an indirect response model. Uh, we'll freeze PK again, <clears throat> and as you recall, we're going to eliminate PK. Uh, but then you want to toggle these options to make sure we're inhibiting the production of effect. Um, and then we uh, edit as textual. And then again, I've highlighted in red the edits that you would need to make to the data. 
Uh, again, we're just commenting out, just as we did for the prior model, anything related to the PK model, we're adding a covariate statement, and it's then the observed concentrations that will be used in the differential equations, and then, of course, we have to sign uh, initial estimates. All right. Also, make sure for all these models, when you run them, use the run option mode of naive pooled, uh, because two profiles is just uh, not enough profiles in order to estimate inter uh, subject variability. Okay? So here's the uh, results of the model fitting for this particular model. Uh, you see we have excellent precision on all the parameters. Um, and again, IC50 comes out to be about 40, which is what we estimated, uh, you know, by hand, by eye. And if you look at the fitted curve, it is a little bit better uh, than the effect compartment model. Um, but still, it's not fitting the high dose, uh, you know, really as well as we want. In part, that's just due to noise in the data, but it would have been good if we'd at least come down and did a better job of fitting the, uh, uh, the Emax, the maximal effect. Um, but again, this fit is a little bit better than the uh, effect compartment model. So now we'll turn to the receptor uh, binding model. Um, and again, Bmax here is assumed to be 100. 100 K on and K off were derived from preclinical experiments, um, and we set them equal to 0 0.0005 and 0 0.02, respectively. And here's the corresponding code for this model. Now, in this instance, there really isn't a good base model, base library model to start from. So I would suggest you just select any model, convert it to text, and then just edit, type in these statements. There aren't very many statements, as you can see, uh, to type in. Um, one thing to note, when you have a differential equation whose baseline value is non-zero, you have to define it with a sequence statement. And here, the baseline value, uh, as you know, when we looked at the plot of the data, is about 100. Uh, in addition, I estimated uh, KD as a secondary parameter. Uh, KD is just the ratio of the K off to K on uh, parameters, and we'll be able to estimate that and uh, get a standard error of it as well. If you're not very familiar with these receptor uh, models like this, then I refer you back to the uh, textbook uh, that Johan and I wrote uh, and look at the discussion on page 843 of the text. Okay. And then here's the result and fit. Um, now look at the observed versus predicted. Now this model actually does a better job at coming down and estimating um, the maximal effect at, at the higher dose. So the fit curve is similar, but I think uh, I'd argue maybe it's just slightly better. Um, we've got pretty good precision for all the parameters with the exception of K on. Um, and the CB there is 0.54, which is quite high, but not unexpected for a binding model like this uh, with, with somewhat limited data. Um, and here's the estimated KD value. It's 56 and the CV is 40. So one thing, again, that is nice, and this, this came up in a discussion at the last PML course, is, is do you get CVs uh, for secondary parameters? And, and yes, you do. Um, if it's able to estimate a CV, it'll report it. It's just here in this case, uh, it's a bit large. So out of the three models, again, the turnover and the receptor model were similar. Maybe the receptor model has a, does a slightly better job uh, at fitting the uh, maximum value. Um, but what we did here to further evaluate the model, uh, we did have an extended data set where we had an additional dose level. So it went 1, 2, which was the prior data set, and, and the scientist was able to uh, test another animal at 4 micromole uh, per kilogram. And these data were then fit to the turnover and receptor models. Um, and when you do that and get a higher dose, um, it does improve the precision. Um, uh, somewhat, uh, particularly for the receptor model. Um, so that we've just got a better understanding of what the maximal effect is. Uh, at two, we're approaching maximal effect, but when we get to four, uh, we're really down to maximal effect of the drug, and then by being more to maximal effect of the drug, uh, we're able to get better uh, CV and uh, precision on the parameters. Um, so here's uh, what the actual observed versus predicted, predicted curves look like. Um, recall before when the turnover model didn't do a good job at, at, at estimating the max for the intermediate dose, 
But when we have three dose levels, it does a much better job um, at estimating, uh, at predicting what the maximal effect is associated with each, uh, each of the three doses. Um, if you look at the receptor model, um, it doesn't quite do as well on the downswing of the low dose as the turnover model does. It, it's overestimating the values. So now that we have three dose levels, um, I think I would argue that the turnover model overall is probably giving a, a better fit uh, uh, to the data overall. But uh, again, it's just a, a slight improvement, uh, but it is fitting that lower dose level better. And then both models are actually able to uh, pretty accurately predict what the maximal effects are at the high dose. All right. So in summary, before we uh, turn to the actual hands-on, again, when you fit these classical PKPD models, uh, essentially the PK model is, is just a smoothing function. And if you've collected PK data at the same times as PD, uh, many times then you can bypass the fit of the PK model and just use the PK data uh, directly. And in this particular data set, we saw that we were able to improve the fits by having a dose range that, that went from minimal effect to maximal effects, and then we see that there was a slight uh, benefit to using the turnover model versus the uh, receptor model, although the fits are, are, are pretty similar. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to move over to the hands-on. So we'll pull Phoenix up here. All right, so here's Phoenix. Burn, can you just quickly confirm you're able to see Phoenix? Yes, I can see it, yeah. Great, thank you. So here's what the data set looks like. We have columns for time and response, plasma concentration, and then we have the dose group. This isn't the dosing that's actually assigned because those doses were only assigned at time zero, but we call this dose group because I repeated the dose value down. So one of the first things you'd want to do with a data set like this um, is do just the NCA. These plots we already had in the, uh, in the slides. I think at this point we've gone through enough examples uh, every two weeks that you're, you're, you're pretty proficient at doing the graphics. Um, but I would plot the PK data. I would plot the effect data. And here's the log data. So when I asked uh, the log of E versus time, Recall that we talked about if you do a slope on these first two or three data points, that's an estimate of K out. So I just plotted the data so you could see what the corresponding uh, plot of the data looked like there. And you can see that, you know, we have a somewhat linear decline on semi-log scale. And then here's the hysteresis curve. And as we mentioned, we have very little hysteresis at the low dose simply because we, we didn't approach maximal effects. Uh, but with a higher dose, we get a nice hysteresis curve. So one of the things we want to do now um, when we fit the effect compartment model is that we need an estimate of uh, KEO. So if you look here on setup, uh, actually I'll show you where it's at. If you send the data, let me just tell it to not show that again. If we send the data um, to WinMonLens uh, toolbox, oh, it's actually not going to let me, let me see if I do it this way. No, it's not going to let me show that. But if you send this to the uh, toolbox, um, there's a function, non-parametric superposition, or some, I'm sorry, uh, semi-compartmental modeling, and in semi-compartmental modeling, it allows you to uh, pick and choose values of KEO, but you have to map time, concentration, and effect, and you guess at a KEO value, and then you click run, and then you'll get um, a plot of the effect uh, concentrations versus time. In this case, I sorted by dose group, okay? And you'll see the hysteresis curve for plasma concentration, which is here. And here it is for the high dose group. Um, but for a KEO of 0.04, we'll see that, and again, if you look at the highest dose group, it does a very good job at collapsing that curve. 
Now, just to show you, if you had tried other values like 0 0.5, see, it's not collapsing the curve. <clears throat> so this isn't a minimization algorithm. You just pick and choose and try different values, and you would generally start with a KEO maybe of about 1, and then you would keep going down to 0 0.5, 0 0.25, et cetera. And then, as we saw, if you get down around uh, 0 0.04, uh, for the high dose, we see that we have a nice collapsed curve, and then we see there's no need uh, for an IMAX parameter. This is pretty linear, no curvature. And then if we look at the half maximal uh, effect, we see that uh, the uh, estimate of the uh, IC50 is around 40. So then we can send that data um, here. We can send this out to um, a Phoenix model, and again, let me see, I'm going to move this back to a different monitor so you can see it. So if I send this data uh, to a Phoenix model, um, this is where, in this particular instance, we want to send it to a PK Emax model. Um, we want an effect compartment. Um, we want an inhibitory function. Um, we can use population, CP, EOBS effect, um, and make sure, again, in run options, uh, if you've got a NLME license on it, you want to run this in naive pool mode. But then you just click this to textual, edit as textual, and Here's what the model looks like. And then as we saw uh, in the slide deck showed this, um, you can do a number of edits on the data then. Uh, let's see if I can, how large I can make this. Um, so you can just add a, the pound sign, which is a comment, and that's getting rid of these PK parameters. So all the PK parameters were just commenting out and then we add a covariate statement, and then we add the initial estimates for IC50, KEO, and I just froze uh, E0 to be 100 because, we, again, we know from this particular assay uh, the baseline uh, is 100. So um, that's the, just the edits on that particular model. Um, if you go ahead and run the model, then we've already seen these outputs, but I'll just go and click on it just to confirm uh, these are the values that we looked at uh, earlier. Okay, for the turnover model, um, that model, you just want to send that to a Phoenix model. Um, and here we want PK tied to an indirect model, and we want to inhibit buildup of effect. We don't need an exponent because it was a, a linear decline. <clears throat> and we're going to freeze PK because we're not estimating the PK in a model. Uh, you have time and EOBS. And I didn't, one thing I forgot to show on the other uh, model is that we need to input the dosing data. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, and again, for run options here, you want to make this naive pooled. Um, then you can convert it to textual. And then in the textual model, you can do the edits. <coughs> in both models, oh, I'm sorry, you don't need to input dosing data because we're treating uh, the plasma concentrations just as fixed values. They're just observed values. They're just covariates. So there's no dose to input. And then in this particular model, if you convert it to uh, text, again, you just comment out all the PK values exactly the same as we did before. Uh, input the covariate C and the initial estimates. Run the model. Um, and again, uh, you know, you get this very nice fit uh, that we saw before. And we could look at 
observed versus predictive values as well. And this is where we were saying, we're saying that the turnover model, you know, didn't fit the maximal effect as well as we would like. And then for the receptor model, you just need to send the data set to any model and then just edit it, uh, as indicated here on the slide. Um, and as we mentioned before, I added a secondary parameter. Um, here was the initial estimates as we discussed in the slide. And then when we look at the uh, results, let me see if I can scroll this over just a little bit. Um, see this model is doing a little better job um, at, at predicting the uh, maximal effect for the higher dose. Um, but then uh, when I add the extended data set, Here, let me look at the turnover model first. So the way to do that is just make a copy uh, of the prior model. Just make a copy of the model, and then on your um, on main, just drag the data set over, and that'll map the new data set uh, to the model. You don't have to make any changes at all to the model. Um, but what we did see when we looked at the slides for the turnover model is that when we increased the dose, then we were able to do a much better job at, uh, at actually uh, predicting uh, the maximal effects at each dose level. So the fact that we weren't able to do it on a small data set was not a defect in the model, it was really a defect in the data set. We just didn't have adequate data uh, for the model to really identify where the maximal effect was. But when we have a, the higher dose level, it does a much better job uh, at, at, at predicting the uh, maximal effects. Okay, so um, Brent, I think that, uh, uh, Bert, that, that uh, concludes the hands-on section. So I'm gonna turn the session back over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan, it was a great presentation. Um, yeah, I would uh, encourage uh, the audience admin to, to um, post comments or questions into the Q&A panel that we can uh, cover in the session. Uh, if not, uh, we will respond to uh, those questions uh, on the forum, so we will post questions together with our responses uh, on the Satara forum. I will send out the link to it, uh, after the event when, I'll, uh, uh, when I've posted also the other materials. Uh, then we've got uh, a couple of questions. Um, one is about, uh, um, you, you know, in this data set you had a maximum effect, yeah, so you could freeze the IMAX two to one. But uh, what about if you have, don't have enough high dose in your study to see the maximum inhibition? Would you recommend to estimate that parameter from fitting? Yeah. Um... That's always a problem, and many times, uh, in fact, one of the prior examples, one of the other weeks, I think we went through PD30, which was another example where we were trying to fit an Emax model but never got the Emax. So one of the conundrums we have is that uh, many times, due to toxicity issues, we're not able to dose high enough uh, to fully estimate um, the Emax. And as a byproduct of that, if you're not able to estimate Emax, IMAX correctly, you'll get bias estimates of the IC50 as well. And there's really not much you can do in a situation like that. Um, I would suggest if, if you're using such models uh, for screening a large number of compounds, um, there are alternate uh, parameterizations um, that avoid uh, you know, uh, the, the fully max that you might want to use one of those alternate parameterizations uh, to come up with a, a, a value that's more stable that you could compare across compounds. But other than that, I mean, there's uh, one of my favorite sayings is there's no substitute for no data. And if, if you're not able to dose out high enough to see the Emax, IMAX, again, you're not only not estimating that correctly, you're going to get bias estimates of the IC50, EC50 as well. All right. Uh, all right. There's, there's one other interesting question, um, and it is about um, comparing uh, the values of K, K on and K off uh, in your uh, PKPD model uh, to uh, in vitro data. If you have uh, lab-derived receptor off-rate estimates, um, 
if, if you want to compare this with the PKPD model derived estimates, uh, would you then use unbound frequency concentrations as PK input? Yes, yeah, you should always use unbound uh, when it, you, you know, whenever you can. The unbound data is much better, yes. Okay. Um, then uh, I've got one question about the receptor model. Um, which, yeah, I mean, it's not a full question. I mean, which parameter is sensitive to, to what? Um, maybe you can clarify. Um, then uh, we've got one other question. Um, would there be a limit of PK samples uh, needed for this approach? Actually, um, the, the nice thing about the model, since you're not fitting a PK model, the, the issue is, do you have PK data collected at the times where you're seeing changes in the PD response? That, that's what you really want. Because, you, again, you, you're not trying to come up with precise estimates of the PK parameters. You're trying to come up with precise estimates of the uh, PD parameters. So depending on how simple or complex uh, the PD, um, the shape of the PD uh, curve looks like, uh, would dictate, you know, the richness of samples that you, re that you really need to collect in order to uh, identify all the PD parameters. Um, okay. So I will, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so I guess right now th there are no further questions. Uh, maybe just take your time and maybe um, enter questions while we uh, close this session. Uh, then um, may I ask you to switch to the last slide of your deck? Uh, da -da, where is it? Yeah. Yeah, before we end this, this session, I just would like to um, alert you of two events, upcoming events. So the one is um, a webinar um, from uh, Jean-Michel Cardot, and this is about uh, in vitro and vivo correlations, and here it's, uh, he talks about nonlinear time scaling and so forth. Anyone interested in that? I mean, this is uh, starting on March 29th at 11 a.m. EST. And uh, after that, uh, one day uh, after that on uh, March 30, we are back with our PML school. And uh, um, Chris Mail will present on sigmoidal concentration response models. Okay, that's uh, the end of our session. Thanks, Dan, for a great presentation, and uh, thanks to the audience for uh, coming to this session. And uh, I hope uh, we will see us again on March 30, and with that, I would like to uh, end this session. You may want to disconnect now. Thanks. <laughs>